Good morning. My name is Emmanuel Tonioli, and I'm uh, with the Center for Complex Systems and Brain Sciences at FAU. And this morning, I'm going to talk to, to you about something slightly different. I would like to present uh, preliminary evidences of a period halving uh, bifurcation uh, in Arctic sea surface temperature. So what I would like to accomplish today is first to showcase uh, methods for spatiotemporal visual analytics, which I developed a decade ago, and then to spend a little bit of time with you to review uh, data on sea surface temperature to get a little bit of a feel about how this technique uh, works. Uh, we will be spending a lot of time lingering on an unexpected finding of a period halving uh, bifurcation of uh, uh, sea surface temperature in a place in the Arctic. And I would like then to spend a little bit of time to discuss, uh, unfortunately, in a very unilateral manner, uh, but my uh, email will be uh, uh, open to, discuss, to further discussions, uh, to discuss the potential uh, theoretical basis and hypothesis regarding this phenomenon. And finally, I would make a call uh, seeking collaborator to continue this work. So I'm a brain scientist and uh, over the course of this work uh, in the brain sciences, I develop a technique uh, to address a very complicated uh, intricacy of space and time that we frequently encountered in uh, our uh, spatial temporal uh, brain data. These uh, methods uh, is a visualization methods and rely a lot on color perceptions. So I have to apologize for uh, uh, the several plurality of people who come here and who will have defect in uh, color perceptions. Uh, if you cannot see clearly here, uh, number seven, 13 and 16, that suggests that you might have a uh, defect in color perception. You probably already know about it. And uh, this talk will be a little bit uh, difficult for you to follow, or at least some aspects of the visual analytic. So here's the problem that this uh, method of uh, analysis is trying to solve. It's called the visualization ceiling problem. When you have a piece of paper or a computer screen, this surface occupies two dimensions, uh, the X and the Y coordinates. And in brain data, for instance, in my domain of electrophysiology, we often want to represent more than two data. And especially quite a lot of time, we want to represent four or five dimensions of the data. So if I take my brain waves, for instance, I can spend a lot of time living in the land of time. And I can look at the dynamics in one space point. So I can take a sensor that is laid over the cortex in this region here that you see in yellow, and I can record the time series that gives me the value of the voltage of my brainwave V as a function of time for one location, which is fixed, X uh, coordinate at location L and Y coordinate at location M. Or I can spend a lot of time to take the other side and to look at the land of space and there, uh, for a long time, we have developed methods where we can represent three values, and that's the ceiling at 3D is uh, represented here. You can represent X and Y of space here, and you can add one quantity, for instance, V, using, for instance, a color bar, a color chart, as you see here. So uh, here we have two dimensions, and here we have three dimensions, and unfortunately, uh, those uh, viewpoints that separate time or space in two different visualizations do not allow us to reconcile their intricacies to see when they co-depend co on one another. And this is a, a, a problem that has uh, plagued visualization for a long time. So the method that I developed uh, about 10 years ago uh, is called a colorimetric encoding. And it consists in redirecting some of those di uh, dimensions uh, to a perceptual space. So in my brain waves that I just presented to you, we have space. It's a surface, so it's going to be 2D. It could be 3Ds as well, X and Y. We have time, T, and we have the wave amplitude, the amplitude of my brain wave, which I call V here. 
So if I redirect as a dynamicist T and V as my X and Y coordinates on a piece of paper, I'm still left with those two dimensions of space, which are very difficult to address someplace, but I can encode them in a, a perceptual space that represent a similarity or distance Two channels uh, that are going to be in close blue colors here. Those are uh, a perceptual space mapped by many people uh, to discover what is similar and what is different. So color will give me a sense of the organization of space. And this is exactly what we did. And with this method, you can break, break the ceiling at four dimensions, uh, at three dimensions, and represent four or five dimensions uh, simultaneously and do analytic. In the new uh, next uh, segment of this presentation, I would like to show you a little bit how it worked with climatologic data. So there is a beautiful big data uh, set that has been developed by Richard Reynolds at the National, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. What he did was to collect over the surface of the Earth plenty of sensors which were very, very distinct and uh, different all across the oceans, and to make them, make them into a gridded data set that interpolate uh, the data all over the surface of the globe, initially with the resolution of 0 0.5 degree of angle, and a little bit later with a higher resolutions. And uh, so this is this uh, sea surface temperature, which is an extremely famous data set developed uh, by the NOAA. So here's an example of uh, this data set uh, encoded with this uh, colorimetric visualization technique I was telling you. And I'm going to show you how easy it is to do some visual analytic and to extract information out of those time series in a very, very direct and straightforward manner as long as you have uh, normal color vision, of course, and I apologize for those who don't. So for instance, it takes about a very, very short period of time for you to realize that the Northern Hemisphere, which has the color blue, uh, purple, pink, and a little bit uh, hot pink here, which uh, you can see here and here, have a much larger amplitude than the oscillations, the fluctuations of temperature that are in the southern hemisphere in color brown, green, and a little bit cyan here, which you can see here. So the um, uh, fluctuations in the northern hemisphere are about three times uh, larger than the one in the southern hemisphere. So I'm not a climatologist. I uh, know that there's a very uh, hot literature about this uh, feature that relates uh, to human mass and all those uh, aspects, but that's not my specialty. But I wanted to show you how uh, intuitive and easy it is to see uh, this feature. You can also very, very easily pick up some aspects such as the fact that this blue color here, which is about Siberia, uh, has a peak in the summer and a peak in the winter, which is always about a month earlier than the peak in the uh, uh, magenta color, which we find here. Uh, so the summer and the winter come in Siberia much faster one month earlier with a phase advance as compared to the winter, uh, uh, sorry, here in the United States and Canada. So you can see that it's extremely rapid to extract information and the information that comes to us speaks about the intricacy of space and time. And we are able to do this because uh, we have broken the ceiling at a uh, 3D visualization. So uh, what I would like to show you today is uh, a phenomenon that concerns the Arctic. So we are going to move uh, not to the monthly record of temperature as I did earlier, but to the one year moving average. And the purpose of this analysis is to remove uh, the yearly cycle that is due to more sun in the summer and less sun in the winter, but to see what persists as a long-term trend when we remove this effect. And this is what you see here. So for a quality control, I want to show you those two extremely large amplitude peaks 
here and here. This is El Nino, whoops, 1983 and 1998, very, very famous uh, climatologic event uh, that uh, has a maximum uh, in the Pacific Ocean somewhere around here, which concerns a lot of space. You see that the density of channel here is extremely uh, important, but which is very brief in time. It lasts about one to two years, both time, and then it's over. And uh, so this serves as a quality control. You can see that the visualization uh, makes sense, uh, has been uh, proved and checked for its spatial and temporal consistency. And uh, the thing that I want to tell you today is this other manifestation that is here. Uh, let me clean up a little bit. And this is this phenomenon that you see in this region, uh, uh, more recent in recent year in this pink color. So the pink color again is about Greenland, Northeast Greenland about here. And you see this large increase, uh, sustained five degrees increase above baseline, historical baseline of these regions uh, in uh, Northeast Greenland. That has last now for uh, one, two, three, four years, and that seems to continue. So this manifestation here is quite different. Rather than being uh, very dense in space and very brief in time, it is the opposite. You see that the channels are very sparse here. So it is very uh, sparse in space, but much more sustained than what you had uh, here with El Nino. And that's the phenomenon I would like us to discuss a little bit today. So let's re-encode this uh, polar phenomenon, obviously, in polar coordinate. So now the new map that I show you is this uh, map that you see here. So uh, Greenland is in green. That means that the color we are interested in now becomes this green color, characteristic of Northeast Greenland. And I want to show you about uh, 12 years ago what uh, seasonality uh, of those uh, monthly sea surface temperature look, record look like. There was a little peak in the summer, and then there was a little flat in the winter. You see in the winter, there's nothing to see uh, in this early period. And historically, the uh, data set from Reynolds goes back to 1981. So from the beginning of this data set, this is what we observe both in uh, Greenland as well as over area of the Arctic circle. So now I want to show you what happens in more recent year. We start seeing in several places, for instance, in Canada, as well as in Greenland, some of us peak invading here uh, the uh, uh, winter time. So winter is no longer a period of restoration and rest with a low temperature. There is activity there. And more importantly, I want you to notice uh, the last five years, there's this main peak here uh, that you can see here, which is in the summer in Arctic, in Greenland, when the sun is there for 24 hours and bring a lot of energy uh, to the uh, sea surface, you see those maximum temperature. And so they uh, speak to the entrainment of the climate to the solar cycle. But there's also a second unexpected peak in February here that you see here, 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 and here. And this is a very, very puzzling phenomenon. You can recognize that in the rest, uh, earlier year, there was no activity in the winter uh, in those regions of the Arctic Circle. And this seems to have come uh, with this big increase in temperature, which I showed you in another visualization with a pink color, uh, with the other colorimetric encoding. So let's think a little bit about what it means. This is the time series taken in this uh, region of Northeast Greenland in the Hagenfjord. And uh, what you see here is that from 1992, you see a little blip in the summer, another little blip in the summer. It varies in amplitude, sometimes big, sometimes small. You see the beginning of uh, lengthening of the summer season with this uh, uh, relaxation time to winter, which is slower with this uh, 
uh, bending of a curve, which is uh, a little bit slower to return to its state. And then you see here uh, in uh, 2010, the first phase transition, so the baseline of these regions was a uh, frozen ocean. And you see the first increase in temperature here. And you, you will see in a moment a second increase in temperature. What we are looking at in this region, in my uh, faint understanding of uh, climatology, is this fjord. So this is the interface between a glacier and uh, the open ocean. And uh, the uh, fjord is uh, withdrawing, the glacier is withdrawing, and we have an area which is giving uh, rise to uh, uh, melting ice and uh, open oceans. This is this first transition that you see here. And uh, what's quite remarkable about the presence of this uh, secondary peak that you see here is that uh, you remember we are very high uh, near the poles. That means that uh, in the summer, there's 24 hours uh, sun in the months of August, for instance. In February, when this second peak comes, there is uh, no sun whatsoever uh, warming this land. So we have an increase in uh, the uh, temperature that seems to go counter to the forcing effect of the sun into uh, the temperature of the land. So uh, what I, I came to this talk with a very, very provocative and very, very big claim in the title. I say that there was a period halving bifurcations. So the first thing uh, that remains to be established is that this phenomenon is not an artifact of uh, flowed data plus interpolation, and that remains to be demonstrated. Uh, when I say that it is a bifurcation, we need to be able to evidence that the system has been going through a transition to a new state, that it is in a new regime. And I hope that the hint that I gave you from the frozen ice and from the changing baseline of those uh, phenomenon was convincing enough. And lastly, when I talk about period halving bifurcation, we need to be able to evidence that this sudden peak, second peak is not noise or an additive phenomenon that comes from another mechanisms like the current of the ocean or something like this, but that it is an intrinsic complexity phenomenon which is associated with the forcing mechanics of a solar cycle. And uh, one of the hints that uh, the data gives us is that uh, there is a remarkable temporal symmetry in the presence of this extra peak. It always comes exactly in the month of February it doesn't come uh, in uh, sometime in January, sometime in February, sometime in March. So half at the half cycle uh, of uh, the yearly cycle, which peaks otherwise in August, meaning that uh, it splices exactly the year in two parts, and the peak is exactly at the middle, what uh, we uh, dynamicists call anti-phase. And so uh, a lot of people uh, who have been for a long time are at FAU will be uh, familiar with a conceptual framework which has been associated with Arnold Stong's. Uh, that's uh, the emergence of polyrhythms or coupling between uh, systems which have uh, two to one forcing systems or uh, uh, three to one or one to three, which depends on uh, mathematics after the Fares tree. So people at FAU have been studying this a lot, for instance, Kelso, as well as Edward Large. And uh, uh, we have found some of this as well in the dynamic of uh, social neuroscience. Uh, this picture has been taken from uh, Hoffman and Bardi, who is uh, one of the collaborators of our team. And uh, as you know, period doubling bifurcations, which have been studied a lot in the logistic map, uh, are related to uh, a route to chaos. In those models, period halving seems to be related to stability. And uh, so there's a lot of uh, theoretical background uh, to this work. So my last uh, few words are uh, to seek collaborators. I would be very glad uh, for climatologists to ground uh, this observation in a context which is meaningful uh, for the uh, uh, Arctic glacier science. 
And I would be very, very happy if uh, some people who are interested in uh, modeling forced uh, untrained system to the solar cycle would like uh, also to uh, share some of this work with us. And I thank you for your attention.